Hello, everyone, and welcome to Building SaaS on AWS, the flagship show for building serverless services on top of AWS. My name is Gunnar Grosch. I'm a developer advocate here at Amazon Web Services. And if you're building or planning to build a SaaS product, well, this is the show for you. What I do here every other week is bring on SaaS experts to deep dive into SaaS-specific topics so you can learn more about building SaaS on AWS. And we want this show to be very interactive. So if you have questions, comments, just put them in the chat and my experts, uh, my guests will do their best to answer those questions. And we usually peek behind the curtain to learn more about how to build SaaS solutions on AWS. And this is exactly what we're going to do this week when I am joined by Alan Helton and Kavadja Shams from Momento. So welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank All you. Right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah, good morning to you. Uh, you are both based in the US, and so it's an early morning for you. Great to have you with me today. So let's start with the usual round of introduction. Alan, let's start with you. Yep. So my name is Alan Helton. I'm a, an ecosystem engineer at, at Momento. And if you haven't heard of that role, it's probably because I think I'm the first one anywhere ever that has that role. Uh, I do... Uh, the best way I can sum it up is I do both internal and external uh, consultations uh, as far as serverless development and uh, developer experience and everything related to engineering goes. Uh, so I've been with the company for about a month now. Uh, I've been advocating and partnering with Momento uh, for about six or seven months uh, prior to my employment here. I was in the public sector. I worked at a company called Tyler Technologies for about 11 years, uh, gaining experience there. I ran development teams. I was an enterprise architect. I was a uh, developer, kind of ran the gamut on what you can do on the engineering side. And uh, along the way, several years ago, I uh, started pioneering the way into the cloud, which is where I started developing my uh, experience with serverless and AWS specifically. Became an AWS community builder in 2020 and started documenting my journey into the cloud. Uh, just everything that I was learning about multi-tenancy, serverless, DynamoDB data modeling, pretty much everything that you can imagine as it relates to the cloud I was documenting on my, on my blog and sharing with the community. And then uh, in the summertime of last year, I was promoted, if you will, to a, an AWS serverless hero. Uh, so Ben diving deep uh, since then and helping as many people as I can. So it's been a, a fun ride, very interesting and uh, diverse career so far and looking to, uh, looking to make more memories along the way. Very cool. And Alan, maybe not all of the viewers know what the AWS Heroes program is. So maybe you can do the elevator pitch of what uh, AWS Heroes mean. Absolutely. And, and thank you for asking. So the AWS Heroes are essentially spotlighted uh, community members uh, that, that AWS recognizes for really, uh, it's a lot of content creation. And all the, all the heroes do uh, have their own specialty. I personally like blogging, but there's a lot of other people that do videos or presentations or uh, in-person meetups and, and organizations. So uh, the the elevator pitch, it's the, it's the members who are very active in the community who have a deep expertise in a particular vertical of, a, of AWS. So mine specifically uh, is serverless. All right, very cool. You're our first AWS hero guest on the show, Alan. So, oh, so wow. that's right. another title honored. for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Alan, for joining. Kavadja, over to you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Gunnar, thank you so much for having me. Um, super excited to be here. Uh, my career started building cameras on board the Mars rovers. I went up the stack, started doing large scale image processing, gigapixel images back in like 2005, 2006 timeframe. Uh, I was the mad scientist at the NASA labs who was just tired of waiting for servers to show up from the traditional world of data centers. 
and became one of the earliest customers of AWS, uh, ported much of uh, NASA's data processing pipeline completely to run in production on AWS. Got really excited just watching the journey. Back then, there was, when I started using AWS, there was one SA. <laughs> And um, not a lot of services, uh, but it was just awesome watching uh, AWS grow and continue to innovate. Eventually, I got inspired by the impact the cloud computing revolution was having on the whole world. And moving over from NASA to, to join this revolution and to really catalyze innovation around the world was very, very exciting to me. So I went from being a customer to being... Uh, an employee at AWS, part of the mission. Uh, I ran DynamoDB at uh, Amazon. And then subsequently, I ran product and engineering for a media tech uh, startup that we had purchased and built six new AWS services on top of AWS uh, and, and uh, shipped those over. And today, I'm at Momento, where we built a uh, SaaS service on top of AWS. So I've been a customer, I've been a builder inside of AWS, and now I'm building services on top of AWS for other customers. So Very cool. Great to have you with us as well. And going to be interesting to hear your insights in, well, I guess, from seeing what's inside of AWS and then being on the outside and building on top of AWS as well. So Let's move over to Momento then, and tell me a bit more about what Momento is and, and what it offers to developers out there. Yeah, we we take a lot of inspiration from uh, DynamoDB. The DynamoDB is just this beautiful system, and, and and my favorite part of DynamoDB is the create table call. The create table call just wonderfully abstracts away all of the complexities required to run a large scale distributed system that can do hundreds of millions of transactions a second. Customers don't have to worry about the number of instances, the CPU behind them, the memory, the replicas, the AZs, all that is completely abstracted away behind create table. Momento is trying to deliver that same experience, but for caching, right? So instead of create table, we have a create cache. And we do our best to abstract away all of that complexity so developers can, with a single API call, get access to a cache that can do millions of TPS, has best practices for security, for availability, for scale, elasticity, all of that is baked in so that they can focus on their core mission and let us worry about the, uh, the nitty gritty details of their, uh, of their cache. All right, and in this hour, uh, we're going to look at not only how developers and builders can use Momento, but also more importantly, of course, for the SaaS builders, we're going to peek behind and see how you've actually built Momento on top of AWS. Look at architecture, see what services you've used and so on. And perhaps some bit of it might be a bit surprising for the viewers. I hope so. So, all right, and then uh, what do you see the the difference is between building a service inside of AWS versus then doing it on the outside like you do now. Yeah, so when I when I started uh, working at Elemental, which is a media company uh, that AWS had acquired, Amazon was undergoing this uh, this new way of building services. So if you look at the services from the early days, S3, DynamoDB, and so forth, they were built in their own kind of proprietary hardware, like a lot of just custom management and so forth. And, and during that time, Amazon underwent this revolution where new services just had to be shipped and they had to be shipped a lot faster. So we came up with this construct uh, of native AWS services. This means AWS services that are built entirely on other AWS services. And sitting inside, I would tell customers, you know, for all of the AWS elemental media services, they're just built on top of the existing building blocks that AWS has offers to all of their customers. You can build your own service like that. And it is really easy for me to sit there as an Amazon employee and make that assertion. It's a lot more you know, real when I'm now on the outside. Our service, we use the same building blocks that a service team within AWS would have used to build a service like this. We, we use NLBs, we use VPC private links, 
We use EC2 instances. We use the Graviton uh, processors. We we use CDKs. <laughs> um, you know, so all the building blocks that you need to compose your purpose-built um, SaaS service are available to you, whether you're inside of AWS or outside of AWS. And that is really good for the world because it means that the... AWS ecosystem can continue to get better and is no longer hindered by only things that the AWS engineers can do. We actually get that fan out from people like Momento where we're coming in and helping build the AWS ecosystem even more powerful by adding a little bit of our own composed uh, building blocks on top of the AWS ones. So to give you a leading question then, can anyone really build a serverless service? Absolutely. I, I think the, to me, all the components are there. And, and this has been true from the very beginning. Like AWS itself is doing this, right? Like in the very, very early days, back when AWS just had, you know, SQS, S3, EC2, EBS, those, those were core primitives and building blocks. And one day somebody came around and said, well, let's build RDS, Relational Database Service. And, and uh, if you look at it, it's essentially... It's an EC2 instance with a control plane that's, you know, that brings up MySQL at the time. And it uses EBS for block storage. Well, EBS has this cool capability being able to snapshot to S3. Well, databases love to have snapshots. So that was cool. That got built in. Eventually, over time, you know, the EBS team kept working really, really hard in their specific domain, right? They added SSD support. RDS team didn't have to do that. And RDS just got better because they were able to offer SSD support to their customers without ever having to build it. So this ability to take advantage of these building blocks that aren't staying stagnant, they're also getting better, right? And the, the cool thing about selling RDS versus you know letting customers build it themselves is the RDS team can be really, really focused on making sure the latest and greatest capabilities become exposed to customers with a single API call and only the relevant ones do. So for us at Momento, we can make the trade-off between whether it makes sense to go to the C7G instances or not. We can do the benchmarking to see how hot each of those instances can run. Hmm. Our customers don't have to, right? And and by virtue of that, we don't have to worry about what are all the details that it underwent making C7G getting faster network or getting ENAs to, you know, to use SRD capabilities inside of AWS. Like all of these building blocks, they just keep getting better. And it allows us to focus on the caching piece. And then our customers to then focus on their business. It's really quite beautiful. <laughs> it is. And uh, what I really like about what you just said is that we often talk about uh, when we talk to customers, to developers, builders out there that learn the core services, that it is important to know those core services because you will probably make use of them in one way or another. Uh, and when we look at the different certifications and so on, many of them are focused on those same core building blocks that you just mentioned because they are often a part of whatever architecture you're building. No matter if you're in the end building something that's going to be a serverless service of some sort, you might end up using those exact building blocks. All right, so over to you then, Alan. Why serverless? Well, serverless at this point is it's a lot more than a buzzword. Uh, you know, the past couple of years, so I started getting into it uh, in early 2019. And that was kind of the cusp of whether or not it was production ready uh, in, in terms of all the capabilities that, that you need to actually build a production grade app, the, the failover mechanisms, the disaster recovery, all, all that good stuff was just kind of emerging uh, in, in 2019. And we saw a trend in the community that, you know, there was the, of course, the early adopters love it. And then there's that gradual uh, curve of the general adoption. And I think we're kind of in the, the upper part there. Uh, finally, it's not, but it doesn't feel buzzwordy anymore. It doesn't uh, feel like you're checking off a uh, buzzword bingo card. Uh, anymore to say that you're doing serverless. It actually has legitimate capabilities uh, to 
support production grade applications. And a lot of the, the benefits of these services are actually realized and understood by many people now and relied upon, uh, you know, like kind of like what Kwaja was saying, the instance elasticity is, is a big thing. It's something, you know, I spent 10 years as, a, as an app dev and I hated worrying about that stuff because really what I wanted to focus on as an application developer was solving business problems. But I had to divert my attention to setting up infrastructure, uh, making sure that load balancers were uh, firing on all cylinders and the load was being evenly distributed. I had to make sure that we were right sizing based on the customers we were implementing for, you know, to make sure we weren't over over provisioning or over provisioning too much. Uh, and, and a lot of these things are just kind of understood to be solved problems in serverless, the instant elasticity, paying for what you use. That's a big thing. I've never seen a higher focus on cost than when moving into the cloud. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a lot of, there's a lot more focus on that than I think I realized when, when we were first getting into it. Uh, so paying for what you use is a big part of it. And the fact that I think Alan got so excited that he unplugged his, his cable. Let's see if Alan is back. Oh, Are you? He's back. I think he overwhelmed the internet by the <laughs> wisdom so. that he was espousing. I know. I just get on a roll and the internet's like, oh my goodness, slow down. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so just finish your last uh, part there, Alan, so everyone gets to hear it. Uh, so uh, I trying to remember what I was saying. I just got so caught up in the moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, focus on cost and, and yeah, focus is important in the cloud journeys. Yeah, so when you're when you're dealing with serverless, one of the things that people understand is that you're you're not paying for idle capacity. You're paying for literally the compute that you're using. So you know, at Momento, we want to bring that to to consumers. There's there are plenty of caching options out there, but they don't offer these serverless benefits. They don't elastically scale with demand. They they charge you for provisioned capacity. You have to manage instances. You have to manage the, the load. It, there's a lot more overhead than what a, a serverless service would typically provide. So that's what we're looking to do. We're looking to fill that gap and, and kind of be the, the first ones into the market that are, that are doing that. Yeah, filling, filling that gap that's out there. But it isn't always the case that it's all serverless or all, well, server full, I guess. Um, it is this kind of spectrum, the architectures we see customers building. So with Momento, for instance, could you use that even though you're using EC2 instances? Absolutely. I think serverless is like the old blood type. It works with anything. And, uh, you know, it's uh, DynamoDB and S3. They've been around before the serverless term got coined or became popularized. SQS, they've been serverless. You can use Dynamo S3, SQS from EC2, from Fargate, from ECS, or you can use it from Lambda. Uh, it serverless is about modularity and it is about being able to support whatever stack there is. And the benefits of serverless, you know, are confined to the service that, that you're specifically using. Um, and you can pick and choose whichever part of your stack you want to be serverless and whichever mm -hmm. part of the stack you don't want to be serverless. So if you just join us, this is building SaaS on AWS. I'm Gunnar joined by Alan and Kavadja today. And we're talking about Momento and how they're building their serverless service on top of AWS. And I've already promised a bit of a peek behind the curtain. So maybe it's time to dive into the architecture and look a bit at what a serverless architecture can look like. So Alan, if we bring up your screen, maybe. There we go. It's a lot more whimsical than this blank screen, I assure you. <laughs> this this is serverless, definitely. This is, these are all That's the things that you have to manage. To <laughs> uh, so we have a, a nice metaphor that Quadra likes to, to go through. Uh, and then we also have a couple of different ways we can dissect the architecture. Uh, 
trying to decide how we want to how we want to approach that one quadra do you want to set up the the sure. story and then i'll kind of follow along yeah so if you're just joining memento is a serverless cache you call it with a create cache api call and behind the scenes a whole bunch of complications get you know abstracted away behind that api wall and where we support data structures uh, and, and collections, but just just for simple sakes, let's just talk about the key value store parts of Memento. And the way we like to talk about it is, um, you know, there's the heart of the system, there's the lungs of the system, there's the brain of the system, and we we have the brain of the system. It's it's this thing called uh, cache admin. This is the thing that's responsible for capacity management. It's the thing that is responsible for the health of the fleet. It's the thing that is responsible for deployments and so forth. The um, the heart of the system, where which is you know basically where the arteries kind of go through, is um, is the routing fleet that we have. And we call them uh, you know it's the cache proxy. This is the thing that terminates your TLS connections. It routes your request to the specific appropriate caching shard that you have uh, configured for you behind the scenes. And then there's the storage uh, engines that we have on the on the cache side, and that's the lung. You know, like it's a they you put a bunch of data into the cache, and then eventually it's volatile data. It kind of goes away, and then it gets more data, and it goes away. And Alan is going to you know draw these components one at a time and to kind of walk you through what a request flow looks like for create cache and what a request flow looks like for a get and set subsequently. Okay, so there's not a lot of magic when it comes to building a serverless service. Uh, and one of the things that I wanna say disappointed is probably a, too strong of a word, but when I came back and peeked behind the curtains for the first time myself, a serverless service is not itself serverless, but rather it's the capabilities that it provides to consumers that are serverless. So what you're going to see is I'm about to draw a lot of EC2 instances. And for the serverless purists, sorry. Uh, <laughs> So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, control plane operations. So this is when a consumer goes in and says, I want to create a cache. What does Memento do? And there's, a, there's a few different layers in here that we have, and they uh, illustrate the, the beauty of the architecture uh, extremely well. So uh, Guaja already said that we use uh, an ALB in here. So here's you, and we have your request that comes in to uh, the control plane. Let me, let me label here. We have create cache. And that goes to what we lovingly refer to as the control plane proxy. It's the thing that fields your request from that ALB. And the control plane proxy is going to pass in the commands down here uh, to the cache admin. And really the commands here are just CRUD operations. So build me a cache, lead a cache, uh, update a cache. It's going to pass those down uh, into here. And what the cache admin does, it has a bunch of Dynamo tables because we here don't believe in single table design. I'm not going to open that can of worms <laughs> uh, here. <laughs> Second um, one, the first one about servers in serverless and now <laughs> not using single table design. That's a whole other episode. Yeah. It, it very much is. I uh, got slapped on the hand a few times uh, at the <laughs> beginning. I even proposed single cache design the other day and uh, really got got told. Not there yeah. yet. Okay, so we have, <laughs> uh, we have all these tables here. Make these arrows look a little nicer. And these tables represent the different, uh, the major different entities that we have that the cache admin controls. So we have things like the customer cache. Here in this table, we have uh, cache pools. And I don't expect anyone to really know what these are. I hardly know what they are. They're, um, they are things that make the oops, service really sing and manage and give the impression that uh, we elastically scale. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. 
Um, uh, so we have cache partitions down here, and these are all. Roger, would you mind, could you explain what some of these things are? Like, I think of everything here, a cache partition is probably the most important entity that, that we should explain. You're on, you're on mute. You're muted. Sorry. When you provision a cache, you, uh, you know, the simplest possible case is you've got one partition. And that's, you know, if you're doing a few TPS, it's fine. You've got, but even then, if you want it to be a highly available service, you've got to have replicas. So in our ecosystem, a cache has partitions. Each partition is going to have some replicas associated with it to get you higher availability, higher read throughputs, higher performance. Um, and a cache is a collection of those partitions. We dynamically add more partitions to your cache depending on how much load you actually have. And this allows us to actually manage the broader throughput. And it also allows us to provide instant elasticity to a given cache. So when we're trying to add or, or scale out a cache for a customer automatically, we're not waiting for EC2 instances to, to wake up. There's warm capacity that is available in the Memento fleet, and we're just allocating some leases to, to that capacity for a given cache. Um, so a cache pool is a collection, you know, it's a collection of caches. A cache is a collection of, uh, of partitions. And the cache admin is basically watching the health, not only of the infrastructure, like the specific EC2 instances where the cache is residing, uh, but also the health of a cache. And that means, is the cache being overwhelmed? Is it, does it have too many TPS for the number of partitions that it has? Is this cache suffering from a noisy neighbor? Is this cache the noisy neighbor? <laughs> Uh, so we can start moving these uh, these caches around so that they're not impacting other customers uh, and so forth. And a lot of this is distributed system complexity that customers should not have to worry about. But in a lot of that, like if you're rolling your own Redis or Memcache D uh, deployment, Unfortunately, these are things that you have to become aware of. You have to become aware of the number of shards you have. If a particular shard is hot or not, these are you know these are all things that you have to worry about. And we are, you know, since we wake up and breathe and uh, and eat and drink cash every day, we focus our energy on providing the automation that uh, that is required to do this right and to make it completely seamless for the end users. So you touched on the noise enabler, and that's something that I would say is probably uh, referred to every episode of Building SaaS on AWS. So that brings us to multi-tenancy, I'd say. How how do you solve for that in this architecture? Yeah, there. Uh, one of my favorite engineers uh, is at Amazon, Mark Brooker. He, he has this really profound, uh, I think it was a tweet in the blog about the fact that multi-tenancy Sounds scary, but it's actually better for your availability, for your performance, and for, for your scale. And, and we have evidence of this, right? Like, what is, like, if you think of what are some of the most mission-critical services at AWS, S3 and Dynamo, if either of those services were down, like, the internet is down. Those are both multi-tenanted services, right? And, and the reality is that if you build multi-tenancy right, you actually improve the availability and the scale stance. Noisy neighbors is a problem, but it is only a problem that uh, if you don't solve for it. So there are specific tools that you have in building multi-tenanted services. The first tool is throttling, right? If you have some control of making sure that a particular customer is not consuming more than their fair share of resources in aggregate or on a given node, Right, that is a protection mechanism that you can use to inject a little bit of determinism in your broader architecture. The second bit of control and insurance policy that you have in building multi-tenant system is that cache admin layer. We control placement. The cache admin can say, you know what, Alan is way too noisy. I'm going to move him to his own node. Right, he's overwhelming the internet, so I can protect the rest of the caches from from Alan's noise. Um, he's actually not that noisy. He's quite pleasant, but you know. <laughs> um, but but this is control that you have, right? And, and this is the automation that you get to build when you're building a multi-tenanted system. The other 
um, underappreciated fact is that this noisy neighbor issue is actually exists as a problem, even in single tenanted systems. You can have a microservice that comes in and overwhelms your cache, your database, a partition, whatever it might be. So customers have to deal with noisy neighbors, even within themselves anyway. Multi-tenanted services just make it really, really easy for you to isolate the type of resources that you have for you to be able to effectively share those resources without letting one component overwhelm another. It's very hard for one Dynamo table to overwhelm another Dynamo DB table. So if you have two microservices that are talking to two different Dynamo tables, chances are they're not going to run into each other. So are the, the EC2 fleets, for instance, are they all pooled resources or can one customer have a, a silo EC2 instance for some reason? Yeah, so this is where the magic of cache admin comes into play, right? Building a multi-tenanted service, we have full control. We can decide to put brand new customers that are less deterministic in, in their own pool. We can have customers that are running mission critical workloads or are more predictable isolated. These are all dynamic placement strategies that, that you can use. If I like somebody very much, or if I'm scared of somebody very much, I can isolate them. And I can do this dynamically. And I can actually make this completely automated if there's a particular customer or a workflow that requires it. And placement is actually the best tool that you have, right, to, to make sure that people can have isolation. And, and now you get very explicit. So if you start placing people in completely isolated land, it's less efficient for that specific workload. But overall, the system can actually be very, very efficient. And, and, and you just, you know, you have this control and you can exert it when necessary, when things are happening that you're not really, um, uh, like when, when you encounter degenerate cases or you find a workflow that is more abusive to the system than you previously anticipated. These are all controls that you can put in place to protect your customers. And then, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong here, then the, the secret sauce that we were looking for with Momento, it's not in the infrastructure. What we're seeing now, that's something everyone can use and they can build, basically. But the secret sauce is the business logic, once again. It's the business logic and it's the operational excellence. Mm -hmm. The multi-tenanted services tend to have, you know, we, we own the end-to-end -end customer experience. And... This is why we're very happy to share like the end-to-end -end architecture. Like you can go build this yourself. There's nothing uh, super fancy here. The, the patterns that we use uh, for building this two-tier caching architecture are the same patterns that are being used at Facebook, at Twitter, and so forth, right? We're just taking the logic that the dedicated caching teams have built at those you know, larger organizations and putting them behind a, uh, a few API calls for, for the end customers. Our core contribution to society, other than just making it really easy, is to make sure that it's highly available, highly performant, and then we keep making it cheaper and cheaper without them having to worry about it. Right. Anything else you want to address in the architecture, Alan? Yeah. Yes. There, there's one other big part. So the first thing before I move on to the other part, I actually want to walk through what I drew uh, as far as the business process is concerned. So let's say I want to create a new cache. Uh, so I, I hit the control plane proxy. I say, I create me a new cache with the name SAS factory. And it goes in here, passes that command down to the cache admin. The cache admin does its magic where it's pulling out some of these warm uh, partitions that are unassigned and assigns it to this new cache. And then what it does is it goes and updates uh, the, the MR2 or the routing layer, which is used to field the second set of things, uh, which are the the data plane commands, which we'll get to it uh, here in a minute. So all the all the stuff that uh, the topography and the internal stuff is passed from the cache admin into the router, so it knows who goes where, when, and where are all the replications. Where how do I get uh, the fastest, or the lowest latency possible when somebody's trying to get or set something? So that's kind of this uh, create. Uh, cache control plane side of it. 
Now, the other piece of it, which is kind of the bread and butter of Memento, it's the, the get and set item. So I've created a cache, and I'm actually going to put an item in there, and I want to get an item out. Uh, so that, I'm just going to, let me copy this for speed of drawing, and I'm just going to move completely over to a new section here. So we still have these two pieces, the cache admin and the, and the MR2, and they still do their thing. But we actually have another piece in here that, that comes into play uh, when we're talking about the actual uh, storage of the data. And that's the storage nodes, where the actual data lives. Uh, and again, it's the same It's the same kind of thing. It's running on EC2 instances. Uh, there's some, some cool nuance in there about the types of uh, data storage mechanisms in there that Quadra can explain if he wants to, but we don't have to. Uh, but here, here's how the data flows. So we have our uh, MR2, which is the router. Oh, hold on. I have to draw you again. I'm going to do a different one this time. We're going to use this guy. So you make a request, and it actually hits an NLB this time because compared to uh, an ALB. The NLB is really nice for us because it um, allows us to not only, you know, pass through the gRPC requests, terminate TLS on our routers and everything. It also gives us the ability to attach to private links for customers mm -hmm. who want to connect their VPCs to our VPC as well. And that is huge for, for our enterprise uh, security sensitive customers as well. So it comes into the, the NLB. The NLB goes to the routing fleet. And if you remember, the routing fleet had, knows the full topography of where everything lives, where all the caches are, uh, and it's responsible for actually passing that request and, and fielding that request down here to a specific storage node to get uh, or set the data. And one of the things that, that we do that I think is really cool is uh, since the data is replicated across multiple partitions, what the router will do is it'll actually go and try to fetch data uh, out of two places at the same time. And it returns the, the first one that responds. So we can keep those tail latencies uh, really, really low. So we don't have just a random one off where there's a blip. Uh, we can uh, back that up with another command that just uh, shoots it back as fast as possible. So there's, I drew another line over here. So the cache admin is responsible for doing health checks on the storage nodes. And if something starts going wrong with storage node or maybe it's coming up to capacity, it kind of fields, fields that and allocates and passes data updates back to the router. So the router knows at all times where it can go and find data. That's, that's the gist. That's, that's the rest of the architecture that I wanted to share. It's, it's a simple architecture, but as, as we already said, the, the secret is in the, the business logic in here. You know, anybody can, can build a serverless service. It's all about the uh, experience that you're giving your consumers uh, to make it feel serverless. So um, I guess, well, I think you've answered it already, but why not build this yourself if you're in need of a, of a cache? Uh, with these basic building blocks? I think if you are big enough, like Twitter or Facebook, you can afford a dedicated caching team that wakes up every day and lives and breathes caches. If you're not that big of a team um, and, and you're constrained for resources, you're going to end up doing this as a side hobby. And for mission-critical things, like things that are in the mission-critical path of your data requests, you don't want those to be in a hobby. And my, my co-founder, Daniela, has this really profound saying that it's always too early or too late to, to cash. And the reason is like this complexity, like this took us a while to build. And, you know, this is something that because it takes so long today, it's like usually adding a cache is measured in sprints because you have to build it, you have to instrument it, you have to load test it and, and qualify for the load and set up policies for auto scaling and so forth. It's either too early where it's called premature optimization or stuff's falling apart, stuff's hitting the fan and you got to hit it under duress. 
And neither of those are good times uh, to add it. And we also see this weirdness where people sometimes end up adding caches where it's not really useful. But there's this weird cognitive dissonance where if you just spent weeks adding it, you're going to think twice before removing it, right? Whereas we make this so seamless where customers are literally showing up and saying, okay, I want to go to production like tomorrow. Hmm. Um, and, and and we have like in our short journey, we've already seen this happen multiple times where, where customers just show up and they they take a large load online without having to worry about any of this stuff. And if they decide tomorrow that they don't need caching, it's just, you know, a couple of API calls that they remove from their infrastructure and boom, like there is no momentum anymore. So we make this into a very cheap two-way door decision for customers to just quickly try it, get all the best practices baked in and remove a bunch of the availability risk, a bunch of the security risks that they would have otherwise if they were building it themselves and while maintaining you know, and we also deliver just productivity and focus to the end users as well. We heard a bit of the Amazonian in you there with the two-way door decisions. Yeah. <laughs> I still bleed orange is, I think, what I said in last week. Yeah. Last week but, you know, yes. there's a lot to learn from uh, from Amazon and apply it um, to, to building these types of infrastructures for our customers. So uh, just quickly then, is there a typical Momento customer today or... Who who's using Momento today? Yeah, anybody going through uh, rapid scale uh, is uh, is pretty exciting for for Momento. And and sometimes you know what we find is if you're running your own self managed cache on EC2 and whatnot, your um, the provisioning granularity is just too high. And we go into customers at very low scale as well. They're running like one or two TPS workloads and they're provisioning instances that can produce like, you know, tens of thousands of TPS. So it's just really inefficient. So we have typically found many customers that are spending thousands of dollars a year on, um, you know, EC2 instances that they are provisioning, managing themselves that just fit in our free tier mm -hmm. for Momentum. Then we've got these customers that are just going through large scale, you know, spin up. So we've got companies like Saturn, which is a high school social network that is, you know, just spreading like wildfire. And, and, and the, the team is, you know, really focused on building new features to engage these high school students further. And, but they want to also make sure that they can scale. And Momento comes in and fits right in to be able to handle the scale uh, that they have without them having to worry about the nitty gritty details. Um, then we have M&E customers, media entertainment customers and gaming customers that have very spiky workloads where, you know, nobody's watching, nobody's watching, Super Bowl happens or a big sporting event happen, bunch of traffic comes in, it's super unpredictable, and then it kind of just goes away. So for those types of workloads, the ability to dynamically handle these spikes uh, is actually a really cool superpower for, for Momento. Um, and customers don't have to worry about whether their particular stack scales to millions of TPS because they know that we're worrying about Momento being able to scale to millions of TPS. Right. And and it's unlikely that, that the majority of your customers will have that spike at the same time. So your infrastructure is easily able to adjust for it. That's right. Multi-tenancy, once again, one of the benefits. All right, so time flies. Uh, I think we could go on talking about this for hours, but I want to get to actually seeing Momento in action as well. If you just joined us, this is Building SaaS on AWS. I'm Gunnar, joined by Alan and Kavadja today, and we're looking at Momento. Um, I think Aaron also in the chat wanted me to try to replicate digital Gunnar. So I'm going to see if I can. I think it was, yeah, quite similar. It's just Nailed as, it. Yeah, just <laughs> as mus muscular that I am. So, all right. Um, Alan, you have a demo for us, I think. Yeah, I do. I do. So, uh, this is a new demo. This is the first time uh, that we're going to be showing this one because we have a lot of demos that show the speed. You know, one of the big things with the cache is that you need it to be fast. That's the whole purpose of it. Uh, be fast and take load off your database. 
uh, we have a whole bunch of those. But what I want to do is I want to encourage people to start thinking about caching a little bit differently. Uh, it's not just about being a read aside cache to your database. Uh, you can store ephemeral data, data that is only valid for a certain amount of time, and use that as your primary data store. So the demo that we're going to go over uh, is actually a chat application. Uh, so the chat is part of, it's going to be a bigger thing eventually, but it's we're just going to pretend like it's, the, it's an in-game chat. So uh, we have games that say last 30 minutes long, and you have your chat that people can talk to each other inside of the game. Uh, there's no need to store that chat history beyond the boundaries of the game doesn't really provide any any purpose. So we can toss all that into Memento and just have it expire automatically. That's one of the things that our SDKs provide is automatic expiration of, of data. So I'm going to first, before I actually do the demo, I'm going to show you what, uh, what we're looking at uh, in this lovely picture inside of Visual Studio Code. So there's a bunch of different caches that we're actually going to use that support a chat slash gaming application. Uh, almost think of these as uh, database tables, really, because that's how they're that's how they're being used. Uh, so you have your user cache, your player cache, and you can see the different types of data that we're caching uh, inside of the different elements or items that's being cached inside of each one of these things. We have, we just last week released uh, four new cacheable data types, dictionary sets, lists, and sorted sets. And each one of those things have their own very distinct capabilities that they can do. Uh, and we're really highlighting those in this demo. So the user stores information and metadata about the user. I can go in and fetch or uh, set individual pieces of information uh, on that user. Uh, for players, this is the list of people inside of a chat or inside of a game. These are uh, unique uh, elements inside of a list. Uh, so I can, you can join the game 100 times. Your name's only going to be in the player list one time because it has to be a unique list. Uh, chat, so this is uh, a ordered collection. I'm trying to find the words uh, here to not use the list over and over again. Uh, so this is going to be when I type in a message, it gets put into a list, and those are ordered uh, by the time they're added into the list. So it's a sequence. Uh, so that's where we put the in-game chat. And then for actual games themselves, you have metadata about the game. Again, kept in a dictionary, which is data that you can fetch individually, the, the whole thing, and update pieces. And then you have a set, which is the list of all the games that are available right now. Again, you want a distinct list. You don't want to list the same game multiple times. And then lastly, we have uh, our connection. So the whole premise behind everything here uh, is that it's being served through WebSockets. So I want to see uh, everything. I want to see the chat as soon as somebody messages me. Uh, so this is where we're storing the connections of everybody that's in a particular game. And we're storing uh, specific information about a user who is connected to our WebSocket uh, in here, so an individual cache item. Now, what that looks like as far as the architecture goes, uh, and let me know if this is too small and you need to make it bigger, but uh, we have an AWS uh, API Gateway website. So I believe that's V2 that has five different paths that we can use. Connect, disconnect, of course, like every WebSocket, but you have join game, send message, and leave game. And each one of those things is backed by a Lambda function. And beyond that, uh, each one of those Lambda functions doesn't connect to Dynamo, doesn't connect to anything else. It connects to Memento because, remember, this is all ephemeral data. This is all data that's going to be going away as soon as the game is over. And so it has the different caches that each one of these uh, messages is connecting to. Uh, and I, I can dive in if we have time a little bit. Uh, and then over here, I have a REST API uh, to facilitate uh, just some of the operations, like give me an auth token, create a game for me. So let's dive in. Let's do the demo. So the first thing that we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to open up Postman. Postman, great tool, love it. Used for testing, creating APIs, everything. Um, so what I'm going to do is first I'm going to auth authenticate. I'm going to log in as Mo the Squirrel. 
So we're good here. And then I'm going to uh, create a chat room called SAS Factory. And this chat room is only going to live for an hour. Uh, so that's uh, 60 seconds in a minute times 60, 3,600. So as soon as uh, an hour is up from when I hit send, everything associated to that game is going to expire. Uh, it's not going to live anymore. So I'll hit send. And what this is doing, Postman behind the scenes, is kind of setting some environment variables behind so the, the demo flows a little bit easier. Uh, so we have our WebSocket. And I'm going to connect to it. And this is using the auth token that I generated a second ago. And it says we're good to go. And I'm going to go ahead and join the game that we just created as well. So you can see I joined this game and everybody that's in the game right now, it's just me. I'm the only one that's logged into that game, which makes sense. Uh, I'm going to open up this other Postman instance. And I'm going to sign in as Gunnar the Destroyer. That is me. And then we're going to log in uh, to the to the web socket and connect to that game. And so the response that I get back is, OK, well, there's another person in here. here. Here's all the people inside of the game. If I switch back to my other instance of Postman, you can also see I received a message that Gunnar the Destroyer joined the chat. So if I wanted to send a message as, uh, as Mo the Squirrel, Let's say message. Change this. This part's not super necessary to the demo uh, as far as explaining, but we're going to send a message to the game that says, Welcome, Gunnar. So I'll send that. And as far as the WebSocket goes, it's gone. It's done. If I join back, I see I have a new message over here from Mo the Squirrel. It says, Welcome, Gunnar. Hmm. So I will send a message back. You can see that I sent the message in here in the back uh, on Mo the Squirrels chat. See this intimidating message, you will be uh, destroyed. So. <laughs> Uh, so that's, I mean, that's really the extent of the functionality of the demo. There's a lot of caching and everything that goes on behind the scenes. And I, uh, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to very quickly just jump in and show you what's behind a, a send message uh, WebSocket action. Uh, so in here, we're using the Memento SDK for JavaScript, and we're loading the we're loading the cache client. Uh, out of a Lambda layer, and we're initializing these three. Uh, we're making sure that those three caches exist. Uh, we're doing some validation. If I tried to send a message to uh, a game that doesn't exist, a validation would come back and say the game's not found. That that's You can't do that. Uh, so we do some validation. We're building the actual message, the, the data structure of the message. And then really what it's doing here is it's making a couple of different calls using the Memento SDK. So the list pushback, which means I'm adding the message that I just sent to my chat history. And then I am broadcasting the message to everybody that's actively inside of that, uh, that game. Uh, what does that look like? Uh, what it's doing is it's fetching all the players in the set. And then it is getting all the connections of everybody in that WebSocket, except for me, because I don't want to see my own message displayed back to me. And then it's using API Gateway uh, SDK to go in and actually send that message back uh, to the WebSocket. But really the gist here that, that I want people to take away is you don't always need a persistent data store for stuff. Right. Things that have... Uh, Things that have ephemeral uh, nature to them, like a game, throw it in a cache. 
uh, caching to me seems to always be handcuffed to databases and that's absolutely not the case. It, it can be used for really anything that isn't long lived. It, it doesn't have to be sidecar there. So there's a demo, very cool. Very cool. Um, uh, we've shared a link to the code in the chat, so you can try it out yourself. But to do that, you also need, of course, to use Momento. And we've also provided that link so you can start out trying Momento for free. Uh, so two links to store. And we also shared a link about, well, we want you to tell us what you think about this episode. Uh, and perhaps also suggest some future topics. So three links for you in the chat right now. Keep them all. All right. So there is a question in the chat around the demo um, from Teosef99. And if you want to persist the cache content, could you do that at the end of the session? You absolutely could. There's, there's nothing to say that you couldn't fetch the entire list and put that into a persistent data store. Could be S3, could be Dynamo, could be RDS doesn't matter where it goes. Uh, we do have the capabilities inside of the SDK to fetch the entirety of an object. Right. All right. Um, with that, it's time to wrap up. This hour just flew by. Um, but I hope we've been able to, to show and explain a lot about how Momento is building a serverless service on top of AWS. Any last words we want to get out there? Uh, we've already told people to, to try out Momento using the free trial. Anything else, uh, Kaja? I, I think it's easier to build your own SaaS or serverless product. Um, it yields efficiencies within your organization. And um, so I would encourage people to do it. If you have questions, you run into roadblocks along the way or just want to bounce ideas, just tweet at me or Alan. We're more than happy to, uh, to bounce ideas. We do this for fun as a hobby even. So please um, just reach out. Very cool. Alan, anything you want to add? We love feedback. We love ideas. I am always genuinely interested in use cases that we haven't covered in demos. So if you have one, please do reach out. I'm happy to build a demo. I'm happy to work with you to build something. I, I want to expose as many different use cases as we as we can to the community. Very cool. All right. And with that, it's time to, to end this week's show, but we will of course, be back in two weeks. And that show is on a whole different topic, of course, about SaaS, but on a whole different topic. We're going to talk about multi-tenant machine learning solutions. You can build them using SageMaker, of course. You can also build it on Kubernetes on AWS using EKS. So we're going to put these two options head to head and look at the implications of the choice we then make. So super exciting episode in two weeks' time. And with that, I want to thank Alan Kvadja for joining me. And I want to thank all of the viewers for joining as well. Thanks for questions and comments. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.